We're going to finish up chapter one of our text by taking a look at the dihedral groups. What we just learned in the last video was how to create a Cayley table for the symmetries of a square using the actions or the symmetries of the square. We replaced V with F, we replaced D prime with RF, H with R squared F, and D with R cubed F respectively, of course. And then we remember that if I'm trying to find a particular intersection of the composition of two actions, I'm going to write it as first taking the row and then the column, but when I actually perform the operations, I'm going right to left. Now, what we have done is we actually created the Cayley table for D4. D, the dihedral group, is essentially the group of symmetries of a regular n-gon. So four gon, meaning of course four sides, and regular meaning that they're all the same size and that's why it was a square. You can do it for any of the dihedral group, and the dihedral group is all of the regular n-gons, starting with obviously n equal to three, which would of course be an equilateral triangle. Now, some things that we should know, you're always gonna have two n elements. So you're in, going to end up with, this case we had d4, notice we had four rotations, and this was four reflections, and that's always going to be the case. So if you're dealing with d3, you're going to have three rotations, three reflections. d7, seven rotations, seven reflections, you get the idea. The angle that you're going to be rotating is always just going to be 360 divided by n. So 360 divided by n, which was four in the case that we just finished, was 90 degrees. So that's everything kind of that we know so far. So let's take a look at some of the elements of the dihedral groups. So an equilateral triangle, of course, is where we have n equal to three which would be called D3. The rotation measure would be 360 divided by three, which is 120. So that's going to be each of those um, angles of rotation. Now again, what are the rotations? Now I could write them as R0, R120, R240, again, just by adding 120 each time, or much easier, R, I'm sorry, E, and then r, and then r squared, where each r is 120 degrees. And then the reflections are always going to be f, and then rf, and r squared f. So essentially I'm taking everything from the rotations and taking it by f on the right. So a square is the one that we just did, that was d4. Rotation measure was 360 divided by four, which is 90. Rotations, e, r, R squared, R cubed, and then reflections, F, RF, R squared, F, R cubed, F. Pentagon, five sides, D5. Rotation measure, 360 divided by five, which is 72. Um, let's see, rotations, E, R r squared, r cubed, r to the fourth, and then f, r f, r squared f, r cubed f, r to the fourth f. And then of course, a regular hexagon has six sides, d six, rotation measure 360 divided by six, which is 60, and we have E, R, R squared, R cubed, R to the fourth, R to the fifth, and then F, R, F, R squared, F, R cubed, F, R to the fourth, F, R to the fifth, F. So in essence, here's what we know about the dihedral group and something you'll want to keep in mind moving forward as we learn more and more different types of groups, special types of groups. So there are two n symmetries, there are n rotations, and those rotations are going to be 
360 divided by n, and we're just going to denote them e, r, r squared, and so on, all the way up to r to the n minus 1. So again, if it's d4, the last one is 4 minus 1, which is 3 r cubed. There are n reflections, and again, we're just going to be taking every element of the rotations multiplied by f. A couple of things we haven't talked about. The order, or the power which returns our element to the identity, of f is 2. So if you'll remember when we had our Cayley table and we had e and we had f and we had a solid line with no arrows on the end, that's a power of 2 because if I perform a flip and then I flip back, I end up back at the identity. The order of r is n because r to the nth power would be e. So r to the fourth in d4 would get me back to the identity. Some fun things here, and I'm going to leave those for you to determine, um, because I think I did assign one of these, at least one of those, on homework. Um, a reflection followed by a reflection is a rotation. A rotation followed by a rotation is a rotation. And a reflection and rotation in either order is a reflection. So I might ask you to explain to me in words why that is. And the very last thing we haven't talked about at all is that the entire group is generated by R and F. Now, if we go back to that Cayley diagram that we had, we had E, R, R squared, R cubed, and then we had F, and then we had R cubed F, R, I'm sorry, R F over here, R squared F, R cubed F, and then we had, remember, the reds here in this order, and this one went in the opposite order. And then these guys were all blue. So when I say that the entire group is generated by R and F and the way that I've denoted it here, it just means it's there's two actions. So one of the actions is R, which was the red one, and the other action was F, which is the blue one. Now, I could also generate it by any other rotation assuming that a is relatively prime to n. So for instance, I could not use r squared because if you'll notice, if I started at e and then I did r squared, then I did r squared, I'm never ever going to get to r or r cubed by continually doing r squared. So it has to be relatively prime to n and then any reflection with that. So I could do r cubed and f would work just fine, or r cubed, and say r squared f, which is a reflection. Um, or I could use two, reflec two reflections, because a reflection followed by a reflection is a rotation, so I'm actually going to get that rotation. And again, I will leave that for you to understand on your own. We have finished up chapter one. Up next, we're going to take a look at the definition, the official definition, and some key examples of groups.